All right, so welcome back from summer break. I hope you had a wonderful, fantastic summer break. I did, but it was really short. <laughs> Would have been nice if it was longer, but that's always the case. Uh, this is Digital Tools for Architects, Archie 136. Um, I apologize in advance for all of you that you're going to have to listen to me say the exact same thing you've already heard me say before, but such is life, OK? Um, this class, we're going to cover Rhino and V-Ray in enormous depth. Uh, which is exactly what you need and what you want, I hope, right? if you're here. Uh, it is technically called Digital Tool for Architects now. It used to be called Digital for Tools for Architects 2, but whatever, you're in the right place. Okay. So uh, my name is Grant Adams. I'm an associate professor here, which translates to I'm only here two days a week. Um, I'm here on Mondays, and I'm here on Wednesdays. My email is gadams at dvc.edu. Feel free to email me anytime. Um, let me know what's going on. If you're stuck on something, let me know. That's what I'm here for. Um, my phone number is there. Please feel free to text me. You can call me. I probably won't answer. But you can, you can text me. Uh, I tend to be a little bit more responsive that way. Um, but recognize if it's not Monday or Wednesday, sometimes it takes me a little time because I do have other stuff to do on those other days of the week. Um, office hours are a little different than in the past. I did this to hopefully accommodate the 135 a little bit differently than the 136. Um, I'm doing Monday from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., more for the 135 people. And I'm doing Wednesday from 2 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, so right after this class. Uh, and hopefully that uh, accommodates things a little bit better. Uh, like previous semesters, those of you that were in the early um, 135 last semester, you know I get here very early. Uh, generally, I'm here at 6, uh, which means this room's unlocked and open and available at 6 should you need that extra time. Not that I'm really having any expectation that any of you will be here, but it is there, and I'm here um, almost all the time. Generally speaking, I tend to stay late, too. Um, so if I'm around, of course, I'm more than willing to, to answer questions and, and help you guys out. Uh, a little bit of background for me. Um, I did the calculation last night, and this is actually my 18th semester teaching here, which is kind of scary. Um, it's kind of scary because I've been teaching these classes that long, too. <laughs> but I, I absolutely love them. I wouldn't be here if, if I didn't. I have a master's degree in architecture from UC Berkeley. I have an undergraduate degree as well from UC Berkeley in architecture. So I did my, my education close by. Um, things have changed a bit, so I may not be as current. A lot of people like to ask me questions about, well, what do I need for this, and what is the requirement for that? Trust me, stuff's changed a lot since I was there, unfortunately. But I still have general, general advice that I'm always happy to give. Um, I do also have a, a, a company that does property management and real estate investments and that sort of thing, so I'm not a traditional practicing architect. The other five days of the week, I do that. Um, but this is a good break, and, and I get to be here and, and be with you, which is certainly enjoyable. Uh, my office is now officially the, the one that's across the way, which you're probably all familiar with. But I'm either here or there, depending. So a lot of you are already very familiar with the course website, which basically means the posting part today will be very, very easy for you. Those of you that have never been in the class, this is for you. There is a website that's associated with both classes that I teach. It's digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. Um, you will visit this website to view your exercises and assignments, to view important course information. Let's say you forgot something that was on the syllabus and you wanted to review it. You can go back and re-download the syllabus, because most of you will just throw it away when you leave this class. That's OK. It's there. It's online. You can print it again if you want it. Uh, there is a course calendar um, that's available there as well. There are, this is also where you will post all of your exercises and assignments. There is not a Canvas or D2L site associated with this class. It's only this website. It's completely independent from school and their system. Uh, I also have lots and lots of tutorials and videos and walkthroughs and settings and downloads, more so than in the 135 class, especially when we're in the V-Ray section. There's lots of little things that you can go get on the website that will save your life. Okay, um, And so they're all there, ready and available for you. Um, there's lots of videos, video walkthroughs. Um, and you'll see, uh, specifically in this class, when we get into the V-Ray section, there's lots of little intricate things about V-Ray. And you'll need little bits of help along the way. There's presets that you can load that will help a lot as well. Uh, and you'll also use this to comment on other students' work. Um, so when people post work, you'll be writing comments 
to that. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. So in terms of the schedule, um, we are Monday, Wednesday. Class starts at 11. Generally, I'll lecture for the first hour-ish of class. Um, so it'll be 11 to 11.50. Um, then we'll take a break. And then we'll start up with the lab section from 12 to 1.50, uh, 12 to 2, essentially. Um, the time fluctuates a little bit. Um, in contrast to 135, where I usually give a formal lecture, this class is much more about this is how you do something. So I'll be, I'll be doing a lot more demonstration, more like the AutoCAD part of 135, um, where a lot of hands-on demonstration, and then you guys will go into lab. Um, I will try to do all of that demonstration stuff prior to the lab section. Um, this class, if you notice, spans lunch, which is always an awkward time for a three-hour class, right? Because you're going to get hungry about halfway through this class, and that's normal. So what I try to do is I try to schedule it where we have that break right after I lecture before you guys start really working on something. If you're going to eat some food, step outside. That's the time to eat, and then come back and finish your lab work, right? Some people choose to just keep working in lab. Um, and then you know, eat after class, that's fine too. But um, it's up to you. And I, I don't expect you to starve yourself through this class. If you want to eat, that's cool. Um, if you're going to eat food, I do ask that you go outside. If you want to have drinks in here, as long as they have lids, I'm cool with it. Um, if somebody else gets mad at you, it's not my fault. <laughs> right? But I won't, I won't say anything. Uh, I can't survive without it. So uh, I'm not expecting you to either. Okay. Uh, as I said, my office hours, Monday, 7 to 8 AM. Uh, Wednesdays, 2 to 3 PM. Probably in my office, but maybe in here, depending on what we're doing. Certainly, as we get into more V-Ray stuff toward the end of the semester, I'm probably going to be sitting in here with you <laughs> more than anything else. Is that written on the, is your office hours written on the? The syllabus, actually, I think it says it's, it's both in the afternoon. Um, so it's a slight change from the syllabus. Oh, okay. but. As long as I'm here, I'm happy to talk to you. OK, so the course description, you guys can read this later. It basically says we're going to do Rhino and V-Ray. Okay? So there's two primary pieces of software that we're going to work on, and you're actually going to start with today. Uh, the first one is Rhino 5, which is a 3D modeling program. A lot of you are familiar with SketchUp and have worked in SketchUp before. Rhino is harder at the beginning to learn than SketchUp. SketchUp's very intuitive, and you pick it up. Rhino can do way more things than SketchUp can. And I would be shocked, uh, and you can ask people that have taken 136 before, if after you learn Rhino, you ever want to touch SketchUp again. Okay? Um, I think it's a great modeling program. Um, I started using it in about 2005 or so um, to do modeling work when I was in grad school. It was the primary piece of software that we were using while we were in grad school. It is still, and you know, it caught on and is still the primary design software that people are using. Um, you hear a lot about Revit. Um, maybe some of you are in the Revit class. Um, that's great for production drawings, for actually making buildings. Um, but the design stuff tends to be done in Rhino. Um, and so that's why Rhino is an important thing. Uh, and Rhino is definitely a piece of software that Berkeley is expecting you to have um, and or Cal Poly is expecting you to have. Um, so you really want to get masterful at this. V-Ray is a plugin that works on top of Rhino. So it's not written by or from the same people that make Rhino, which is a company called McNeil. V-Ray is by a second company. Uh, I think it's a Dutch company or a Danish company or, or something. They're called the Chaos Group. They write V-Ray. Um, and it works as a plugin. It does the photorealistic light renderings that we see um, very commonly uh, in architectural renderings. Um, and so it's the predominant one. It's very, very accurate. Um, it will calculate 8, 16, or more bounces of light, um, light reflected into other light, reflected again, reflected again, reflected again. You get the idea, right? So it's very accurate, very, very good at what it does. Um, we luckily. Uh, have it here, and it's something that you can learn. It is unfortunately, because of the accuracy and the complexity of it, it's a little bit of a pain to learn uh, and to work with. And so I, I used to teach this where I, we would do a bunch of Rhino in the beginning, and then we'd do a bunch of V-Ray at the end. And I found that if I, I give V-Ray to you in little chunks along the way, it seems to be a little bit more intuitive, and you can digest it a little bit more. Um, so we'll be working primarily in the beginning with materials 
and kind of how those materials, then we'll move into lighting. Uh, and then at the end, we get to do the like the night renders with the big lights and everything that everybody always wants to learn how to do. So we'll build into that. We will definitely do night renders, both interior and exterior. So you get a lot of, of, of how lighting works uh, through V-Ray. Great, great piece of software, but a little challenging to learn um, along the way. It currently, and we'll see if somehow it magically fixes itself, it is not working on these computers since they redid it. So they're still working on that part of it. So we won't get to touch that today, but we will definitely work on Rhino today. There is a required textbook for the class. Um, if you guys took the class before, you probably already have it. It's the same book, so you don't have to buy it again. So I just saved you money, right? Life is good. Um, it's the Digital Tools for Architects Handbook, um, and it's great because it has all the stuff written out uh, that I'm going to go through, especially when we get into the technical details about V-Ray and that sort of thing. It's nice to have a reference. It's nice to be able to write stuff down and make notes of the settings that you use so that you could go back and do it again. So I, I ask that you bring that with you to class um, so that you can reference it and, and work from it uh, as we go through. Uh, grading, this looks very, very similar to what you guys saw in 135. Um, your grade, by the way, those of you, I keep referring to 135 because there's so many people that have taken 135 already. There is no prerequisite or no requirement to have taken 135 before you take 136. It makes no difference. Um, so if you're here and it's your first class, that's great. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Um, but because there's so many people that have taken 135, it's easier for me to kind of explain uh, against 135 the changes for those people. But Grading, there is no midterm or final exam for this class. I'm not going to sit you down and test your ability to render in V-Ray. Doesn't work that way. Um, you instead have a grade that's based on part one, your lab exercises. That's worth 20% of your overall grade. This should sound familiar, right? Your assignments are worth 40% of your overall grade. There will in all likelihood be four assignments prior to the final, which means they're worth about 10% each, OK? Uh, your final project is worth 30% of your overall grade. We'll talk about that in a second and what it is. And then we have participation, and that's worth 10% of your overall grade. It is my goal to keep this class a very even workflow so that you're not panicked at any point in time. It's great to take it when you're taking some other class. How many people are in 121 or 220 right now? Right, A few of you. Not as many as I would have guessed. But those of you that are in some kind of a studio setting, there's no reason you can't do this in conjunction. Uh, and that's part of why I set it up that way. So let's talk about each of these individually. Um, lab exercises are collectively worth 20% of your overall grade. It means they're worth each about 3% or something like that. They're very, very small. Actually, that isn't right. 0.3%, I think it is. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, the exercises are designed to be done in the lab period of the class. Right? So I'm only expecting you to work on it through the lab period, and then you'll post whatever you have, however complete it is, by the end. Okay? Um, they're due at the end of the lab period on the day they're assigned. So for example, today you'll get exercise 201. You'll have to work on it today during the lab period, and you'll have to post something at the end. Lab exercises are graded on a pass-not-pass pass basis. So you do it, you get 100%. You don't do it, you get a 0. It's very easy. Right? So these are really, really great for padding your grade, right? You can bump your grade up just by doing the exercises. If you're here, you do them, you help your grade significantly, OK? Um, all you have to do is do them to get credit. Assignments tend to be larger and tend to require work that's outside of class. Typically, I'll give you a little bit of time in class to work on something, because there's always a few questions here, questions there. But you will probably need to work either in this lab or in the 116 lab across the way, or in the 124 lab at the corner back there, depending on which one's open, to do some work outside of class. Some people choose to uh, purchase student licenses for Rhino. Um, I believe that Rhino also has a 90-day trial. So if you do the math and start your trial 90, when, it, when there's only 90 days left in the semester, you can use it the rest of the semester um, for whatever that's worth. Uh, other people manage to acquire it in other ways. Um, I have no comment about that. Um, so if you want to work on your home computer, that's fine. But when, you, when it comes to V-Ray and when it comes to rendering, I promise you, you will want to work in the lab. Because we'll, we're going to use a network render where we harness a bunch of computers together to help your rendering out. It's significantly faster, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 times faster than trying to do it on your own computer, no matter how good your computer is. 
unless you're like Phil and has the ridiculous computer that he has. Anyway, but most of the time it's better off uh, to do it to do it here. Okay. So your assignments also are graded based on the skills that you use and the overall design. So how good is the piece of furniture you design? Both how well is it represented and how well designed is that particular piece. For example, uh, the first assignment is a table and a chair. So that's why I'm using that as an example. Um, they're collectively worth 40% of your overall grade. You may elect to improve any of your assignments by submitting a regrade for that assignment. This policy is very similar to 135, for those of you that have done it before. Basically what it means is you turn in your first assignment, you turn in assignment 201, and you get a C on it. And you're like, yeah, I didn't really like that. right? You can do it again, and I'll pretend as if I never saw it, and I'll grade it again. That grading happens at the last day of the semester. So I won't regrade it until the last day of the semester. And your grade can go up or it can go down, depending on how you did. Right? So you can't automatically assume that your grade will go up by doing a regrade. 99% of them do. But you have to do a better job on the regrade than you do on the first one. Okay? Um, all regrades happen at the end of the semester because you only get one regrade for each assignment. So there's no reason for me to regrade, and then you want to regrade again. It's too much paperwork to keep track of. So you get one shot at each assignment to regrade, should you want to. If you think you're going to regrade, do the work earlier in the semester rather than later. If you wait until the last day of the semester and think you're going to do a regrade, you're going to run out of time. I promise. Okay, So don't, don't wait. Course participation. So after most of the exercises, and in this class it's a little different than 135 because I will be very specific on your exercise saying you should comment on this exercise or not. Okay? Because not all of them, they're in the, especially in the beginning, like today for example. I will make you comment just so that you have the experience of commenting, but everybody's going to do the exact same shape because I have to teach you certain skills in Rhino, I have to teach you how to do things. So there's not really a whole lot of point in everybody commenting on the same shape when everybody does the same thing. So there will be an, a fair number that are exempt from comments. But whenever you do something that has a little bit more design involved uh, or involves some rendering or whatever, that's when the comments really start to happen. Uh, in 135, I think we did like 80 something comments for the semester. In this class, you'll do more like 50. Right? So there'll be, there'll be a drop off of comments uh, for this one. But when you do an exercise or an assignment, you're going to be required to comment on three of your fellow students' posts for that particular uh, exercise or assignment. The idea here is to give good quality feedback on something that somebody should improve on. Right? By saying, this looks really pretty, that's not helping anybody. Right? We want good concrete, you, you, know, you modeled this really well because you did this, or maybe you should consider using the sweep on this because it would turn out better, or whatever. Right? You want to give constructive feedback as part of it. This is part of your participation grade for the class, so you do get graded on it. OK, so in terms of materials, you are required to have a flash drive or a hard drive for this class uh, to work from. If you save work on these computers, it will wipe um, whenever the computer restarts. So you will lose whatever you have. Um, because these are running Windows 10, I believe, and you each have your own student account, I believe you'll be able to log in to the Microsoft OneDrive and store your stuff in the, the OneDrive system, uh, which would be great if you installed it on your home computer and you know, kept all your files in sync and therefore you wouldn't lose anything. It would also be a good place when you're rendering to set up an autosave so that it goes into that folder and then, then um, backs itself up. So I'm still kind of experimenting. It's new for me. I haven't done it on a large scale. I haven't watched how, how it really works. But it is available on these computers because they're Windows 10. Um, so that may be something that's, that's useful to you. I would still recommend a flash drive or a hard drive. Um, minimum size for this class is 32 gig empty drive. Um, you will probably burn all of that space over the course of this semester. Um, a 32 gig drive is what, 10 or 12 bucks? It's, it's not bad. Okay. Uh, a lot of people have, went, have gone the route of actual external hard drives that they bring in and plug in. Um, that may be a good option when you start to get here. Part of the challenge with this class is you start to collect oh, all these material files and all these uh, HDRI background images and whatever. And so you build more of a library to this than, say, in, in 135. So you've got a lot of background stuff that you need. And Rhino files by themselves can get pretty large, when, especially when you're working on your final project. Um, so more space is definitely good. 
Um, do be careful to safeguard your information, whether you're syncing via um, the OneDrive or you're uh, you know, backing up your hard drive or whatever. Don't run over it with your car. Don't keep your flash drive in your pocket and take off your jeans and run them through the wash. You know, all of those things are bad, right? And I've heard all of those. Be careful not to snap it off in the computer. That happened one semester. Somebody sat down and broke it off. Um, you know, stuff happens. So be careful. It's your responsibility to keep your work. If you come and whine to me that you, you know, lost your work because it went through the wash or whatever, it's not my problem. Back up your work, right? You're old enough to do that, just do it, okay? Uh, there is one project, we're gonna make some uh, physical topography that will laser cut, uh, that you'll glue together. I'll teach you how to do that. It will require some modeling supplies, i.e. a piece of cardboard, some glue, and maybe a, an X-Acto knife. Chances are you probably own all the stuff that you need or can borrow it. Um, the cardboard you'll buy at the bookstore for, you know, I think it's like four or five bucks a sheet, not a big deal. Um, but there will be a little bit of physical modeling supplies that, that you'll have to buy. Uh, I'd say no more than 20 bucks worth, okay? Just to be aware. Uh, additional course guidelines. If you're um, not going to be in class, I ask that you text me or email me saying, I'm not gonna be here today. Uh, that's helpful for me because I'm not gonna sit around and wait for somebody to show up. And that's, that's a big advantage when I'm starting to, uh, to, to plan for the class, et cetera. So just text me ahead of time, let me know, hey, I'm not gonna be here, All right? A lot of you guys have already done that before, I appreciate that, okay? Uh, if you miss class, right, if you miss two weeks or more, I may withdraw you. And uh, I have a different philosophy than some of the people uh, that teach. It's my belief that this is a college level class. You should want to be here, at least I hope you want to be here. I want to be here teaching you. Um, but that being said, if you're not doing very well, when you get a grade sheet and you're worried that you're not gonna pass the class, withdraw yourself from the class, right? If you decide to stop showing up and you vanish like one of those or two of those people that vanish every semester, right? Withdraw yourself from the class. Don't rely on somebody else to do it for you, right? When you move on to Berkeley or Cal Poly or any other school, there will not be somebody holding your hand saying, oh, don't forget to drop your class, right? You just get an F, that's the way it works, okay? So. Draw, withdraw yourself if you're worried about it, okay? Uh, assignments are due on the day they're um, scheduled to be due before class starts. So you can't walk in here, I start lecturing, and then you post it. It'll be late at that point. So make sure it's done before the start of class, okay? If you, if you wait until right before this class starts, Remember, I have the morning class that's all trying to post their exercises or whatever at the end of that class, so there's a bunch of traffic. So give yourself a little time, post it a little early, never hurts, okay? Um, exercises are due at the end of this class at 1.50 on the day they're assigned unless it's otherwise noted. Generally speaking in this class, you won't always finish everything. You might have something that's half finished. At least post something, right? Post a screenshot, post some record of how far you got. Right? That's important. Um, one of the things that happens, especially towards the end of the semester in this, is we all get in different places uh, doing, working on our final renderings, and you may not have exactly what I'm asking for in the exercise. All that I ask is that you post something. Okay? So it's important to just make sure every day you're posting something. So of course, I'll be here for one-on-one -on -one help um, during office hours, et cetera. I try very hard, and you guys have all experienced this, I try very hard to get to everybody, right? When you raise your hand, I try to come around and help you. Um, if you're sitting there like this for a really long time, okay, ask the person next door to you, do you know how to fix this, right? Or do you know how to get me going? Because it may take me time to get to you, and there's no reason to waste all that time, okay? So just remember, this equals ask your neighbor, okay? Um, I strongly suggest you bring the little handbook with you so you can take notes in it. The advantage there is when you move on and you're in 220 or you move on and you're at Berkeley and you wanna go back and remember what were those V-Ray settings that I used, right? It's in one place. It's easy to go back and get them, okay? Uh, all work done in this class is done under a Creative Commons license, which just means we all share everything that we do. If you have a problem with that or wanna talk about it, we can talk about it during office hours, okay? About five years ago, I had somebody who had issues with this, so this is always just part of it and you get used to it. So the late work policy, um, it's very punitive because in the world of architecture, you can't be late. Okay, let's say that you are working on a project 
and you have a design review hearing coming up and your project is it has a set deadline, it has to be turned in to the city staff by 4 p.m. on a specific day. Well, guess what? If you turn it in at 4.05 that day, the staff is going to be, no, I'm sorry, you can't be on the meeting, you have to get pushed back right, to another meeting. Maybe you have to wait two weeks. Maybe that meeting's full, you have to wait a month. It doesn't work in the world of architecture. You have to meet your deadlines. So I have a very punitive late work policy. Okay? If we had something that was due today, and you didn't turn it in before I started talking today, right? and you turned it in prior to the start of next class, you'd lose 10%, or one letter grade. It was an A, it becomes a B. Okay? If you didn't turn it in before the, fall, the next class, and you were late again, so this would be you turned it in before next Monday, before I started, you'd lose 20%, two letter grades. Okay? So we go all the way down four letter grades. If it's more than four days late, you get a max cap credit of 50%. So I don't go below 50%. If you turn it in, you get 50% if it's really late. Okay? That is still a lot better than getting a zero. But the moral of this story is turn it in. Turn it in on time. Okay? All the better. Okay. I think that's all for the, the text part. I'm going to run through a bunch of pictures just so you can kind of see stuff that is done and modeled in Rhino. Some of this um, is done with a little bit of Photoshop, but I can't help myself by showing some of those examples. Uh, we'll talk a lot about physical construction of components. How do you make things? We'll make topography um, such that you can laser cut. The idea is get something out of your um, 3D world. Um, and so you can, you can end up laser cutting and building complex models and joints and that sort of thing. So let's look at some student work. These are renderings um, from prior semesters. Um, some are better quality than others. But you get kind of get a sense for lighting conditions. We're going to talk about how do you create lighting. Some people do some Photoshop uh, along the ways. Most of you have taken 135 already. Guess what? You know Photoshop. Okay. One of the things about Rhino and V-Ray is you can model uh, a huge amount. Obviously, you're doing the modeling in Rhino. Then you can get into V-Ray. And you can render everything completely photorealistic. Okay. But you could spend, you know, 80% of your time on the last 20% of the rendering. Okay, it's the 80-20 rule. If, however, you threw in like a Photoshop background or whatever, you could save a huge amount of time as part of the rendering. So just because you're in 136, if you feel like using a little Photoshop, go ahead and use a little Photoshop. I won't penalize you for that. Okay? And obviously people have added, you know, extra entourage and people, and it's a little washed out. You guys can look at these later on um, online and get a better sense. Everybody loves the night renderings, no surprise. Um, they're always fun. Um, so we're going to make sure that you guys learn how to do that uh, and work with it. The day renderings are equally as important. We'll do some sunset renderings so you can do that um, and get comfortable. The other thing that I will emphasize um, is 2D drawings out of Rhino. So I think. One of the things that I've done in previous semesters um, is we concentrate so much on the 3D renderings that we lost track of, wait a minute, I, I've worked on this 3D model. I need some plans, sections, elevations. This semester, we'll spend lots of days working on traditional plan sections, elevations coming from your 3D model. So we'll, we'll build everything in 3D, and then we'll be able to cut those um, plans and sections and elevations, et cetera. Oh, you can't barely see that one. Sorry. OK, so we're going to take a break um, for 10 minutes or so. And then when you come back, right, we're going to sit down and I'm going to teach you in your first bit of Rhino. So we'll talk through the Rhino interface. We'll actually build something. And then we'll deal with registering and making a post. Those of you that have all done the registration and post already, you will use your same accounts from last semester or previous semesters. Um, and we'll make a post of a screenshot of what you did. Um, but the key is that we'll actually spend some time making something today. Okay? So let's take, uh, I don't know, let's take a 15 minute break. So we'll come back at 11.55. Okay, I'll start back up again. And we'll go through Rhino, et cetera. OK, so we're going to start back up uh, with exercise 201. You guys should all have the handout um, for it. 
for part one, um, this is relevant to the people who have not been in one of the one of my classes before, uh, so they don't already have an account. Um, I'm going to walk through the website a little bit and tell you how to register for the website so that you uh, get familiar with that. Um, I'm not going to sit and dwell on the website registration too long because there's not so many of you that I can't just come around and help you individually if you get stuck. Uh, and then we'll move into Rhino. But it's important to at least um, to, to get you registered um, because there's a file that I want you to download uh, as part of the beginning of, of the class. So uh, this is the, the Digital Tools website. It's digitaltoolsforarchitects.com. Uh, when you get here, you'll see the home page. It has a little scrolling banner that the images change and whatever. There's a menu structure that'll give you access to a bunch of the tools that you're going to need. Below that, there is a, a link of current student work. Um, that changes all the time depending on who's posted what lately. Um, there's a link to the book, so you can buy the book. And then if you come down a little bit further, I, I tweet every time that I post a new lecture, so you guys can check that if you're looking for a particular lecture. And then at the very bottom um, are images that people who have graduated from uh, the digital tools classes post of their work and, and whatever. Um, so that's there if you want to see what other people are doing and or working on. As we go across the top, um, the About menu here, we're lo always looking for Archie 136 or A136 or things that are the 200s series. Those are all your class. Um, and then under Digital Tools for Architects 2 here, uh, we have the course syllabus, we have a calendar, we have the calendar feeds if you want to subscribe to them on your phone or, or whatever, uh, so you can see what we're doing and when assignments are due and, and that sort of thing. Um, if you're struggling to, to deal with the course calendar or you want to subscribe it or whatever, let me know and I'll help you do that. Um, but we won't spend a lot of time in this class actually talking about it. The syllabus, uh, when you click on that link, looks something like this. It's just the text version of everything that I handed you already. Um, if we move forward to the Lectures tab, you guys are going to go to the Digital Tools for Architects 2, 136, and then it's Fall 2016, um, which it looks like I clicked on the wrong link. My bad. Let's see if that decides to load. There we go. There's Lecture 201. This is today's lecture. If I were to click on today's lecture, you will get a summary. There we go. Um, First thing will be the recording. Obviously, there is no recording yet because I haven't processed it yet. Usually, the recordings take me about a day before they're posted. Uh, below that, I have previous lectures. Um, so you can go back and see spring, fall, going back in time. Um, so if you needed something that was in the lecture uh, and I haven't posted our current lecture for this semester, just watch the one before. There may be subtle differences, but for the most part, it's similar. Um, sometimes the ones before, the numbers don't match. That's OK. I've deliberately changed the numbers. And it'll be, you know, for example, 201 is always 201. But you, know, you might be down the road, and our lecture is 208. And somehow down here, it's listed as 209 or 207 or something. That's because it was a previous lecture that was different. But the topic should always match. Okay. Uh, below that, I have links to the PDFs of the slides. So if you wanted to go back, for example, and look at the pictures that I showed today because the screen didn't show them very well, you could click on them uh, and download the PDFs if you want. There is always a four slides per page option, so you can, you can save paper if you were going to print it for some reason. Okay? Uh, and in this case, there's a lecture note to the, uh, a link to the uh, syllabus if you wanted that. Uh, as we move forward, if we go to the Exercises tab and we go to Fall 2016, we'll get to Exercise 201 here. This is the one that we're going to do today. Okay? This is the printed version of what's online. So they're the same, or they're supposed to be the same. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, there's almost always a PDF. That is the PDF that I printed and gave to you. So if you needed to print it again, or let's say you missed class, I don't keep copies. So if you missed today, and you came to me on Wednesday and said, hey, can I have a copy of the handout for, for uh, last class? I'd say, go online and print it. Okay, that's, where they all, that's where they all live. They're all there if you want it. Uh, the nice thing about the online version versus the paper version is I try to make all the links clickable. So if I refer to something specific, you'll be able to click on it and go from there. Okay. As we go forward, assignments, there haven't been any assignments posted yet. Under resources, there are some things that will be of use to you down the road. Uh, most notably um, are the V-Ray materials library. Um, and underneath there, I have some other special little 
uh, things that can help. There's an ultimate V-Ray guide that'll help you through troubleshooting. All of this will make more sense down the road. Nothing you need to do today. I just want to point out that it's there. Uh, the Rhino blocks are useful. Uh, the proxy objects can be useful as well. So they're all there and they'll help you as, as you go forward. Okay? Under student work, uh, you can see student work for any particular semester. So for example, I could go to Digital Tools 136. I could go to Assignments. I could pick Assignment 201 and I can see the work that students have done in Assignment 201. Uh, or excuse me, in this case I picked Exercise 201, which is the one that we're going to do today. Uh, and so you can see all the work that previous students have done relating to that particular exercise. Does that make some sense? Okay. So all that, all that work is there for you to look at. And then we get to the last option, which is Login. For those of you that already have an account, you click on Login, type in your credentials, and you're logged in. Uh, I'm going to switch browsers here so that you can see that, because obviously I was already logged in on one of uh, the browsers here. Um, normally you would just type in your username and your password and then log in. For those of you that have never had an account here before, once you get to the login page there's a link to register. You'll click on that register link and that will take you to something that looks very similar. Here you will pick your username, type in your email. It does not have to be your school email. A lot of people would prefer to use their Gmail or whatever. The only thing I will tell you is if you use your Gmail, uh, this works for if you reset your password because you forgot what your password was last semester. Chances are the email that gets sent will go to your spam folder. Gmail, for whatever reason, likes to think we're spam. So uh, check your spam folder if you're not finding it. Um, then you need an invitation code. This is so that I don't get a bunch of random people signing up for the site. The invitation code is right here, DTFA student, all capitals. Go ahead and type that in. Um, like that uh, as part of the registration. Okay. Once you register, uh, it will send you an email with a temporary password that you can then reset to whatever you can remember. Okay. Uh, one important thing is when you're picking your username, try to pick something related to your name, first name, dot last name, first initial, last name, you know, whatever, because I have to be able to find you. Right? If you do, you know, sexy hot daddy one, two, three, I don't know who the sexy hot daddy is in the class, right? So make sure you, um, you know, pick something that's, that's related to your name, okay? Because I have to be able to grade you based on what name you pick, okay? Chances are all of you, or a lot of you already have your username, so you don't even have to worry about this, okay? So if you haven't already registered, you're going to need to register for the site. Um, today, we're going to work on this exercise 201, which is to make this simple shape. You can see the simple shape on your little handout, but I'm going to walk you through step by step. The very entertaining thing about this is this exercise will probably take you 45 minutes plus to do it. If I asked you to do the same exercise at the end of the semester, it would take you less than 60 seconds. That's how fast you'll become. So there's a big difference in the start of the semester to the end of the semester, and that's to be expected. Okay. So you're going to need a specific file to get started. You can start with a fresh, brand new Rhino, but I've already pre-done a few of the settings, which will make your life a little easier. So I'm going to go ahead and today I'm going to go to Exercise 201. So I'll go to Exercises, and I'll go to Digital Tools 136, Fall 2016, and I'll click on Exercise 201 when it shows up. Okay. Halfway down, under Part 2, you're going to see a please download exercise 201.3dm file. Okay, this is the file that we're going to start from today. And so I'll go ahead and right click on it, and I'll say Save Link As. And I'm just going to save it to the desktop, and it should be exercise 201, and it should be a Rhino 3D model file. And I'll go ahead and click on Save. And I can't remember if you're not logged in whether you can see that or not. It might block you. Give me a second and I'll update this and make sure that it's not blocked out. All right, let me update that. So if you, if you weren't logged in, it would block you out from doing it. I'll, I'll undo that. Um, and if you refresh the page, you'll be able to download it even if you're not logged in. So we can move forward. OK, so now that I have that file downloaded, 
I'm going to look at my desktop here. I should see Exercise 201. Long term, you're going to be putting this on your flash drive, right? But for today, we can put it on the, uh, the, just the desktop. If I double click it, it will start Rhino. Okay, and it's going to say yes, so we'll keep using Rhino 5. We don't want to use Rhino 4. And it's going to start up Rhino. So we'll wait for a second for it to finish. OK, so I have my exercise file already open. Is it asking for a password or something? Anybody else? Yeah, you can try, try to cancel it and see. We'll, we're going to have to work through some of the kinks. OK, um, so let's close that. In the ideal sense, th what you see on the screen here is probably how we're going to ultimately set up your Rhino workspace. And as I glance over your shoulder, some of you have a bunch of other things like Rhino Cam or whatever showing up on the left hand column. There should be a little X next to those. You can go ahead and close those out because you're not going to need them for this class. Okay? We, we will probably load up a few extra toolbars, one of which will be um, the V-Ray tool panel, but we'll get to that once we unlock and thaw the computers. But this is essentially what we want to be looking at. Um, and so I want to walk you through kind of what's going on in here um, so that we can see what's, where certain things are, et cetera. How many people have worked in AutoCAD before? Okay. The good news is if you've worked in AutoCAD, right, it should be relatively easy to pick up Rhino. The two work very similarly. A lot of the commands are the same, et cetera. So uh, that's a benefit. If you've never worked in AutoCAD before, the good news is after this semester of working in Rhino, you'll probably be able to work in AutoCAD. Right? So it works nicely. OK, so in the Rhino um, menu here, I have a variety of ways of accessing commands. Across the top, I have a traditional um, file structure. So everything that we're going to do today is available via just these menu items. So for example, if I wanted to draw a rectangle, I could go to the Curve menu, and then I could select Rectangle, Corner to Corner. Okay? This is not exactly the fastest way of drawing a rectangle. But it is available there. So if you get lost, you can always use the menu structure. Directly below the menu structure at the top, you have a command line that's very similar to the command line in AutoCAD, okay, which will allow you to type in certain commands. If I were modeling in Rhino, if I were going to model the shape here, 90% of the input that I put into Rhino goes into the command line. It's significantly faster in how you work in Rhino. Unfortunately, you haven't memorized all the commands yet. You don't know those commands, so it's really hard for you to be able to use that command line too much. But the reason that I point it out is you always want to be kind of glancing up at it because a lot of times you'll be in the middle of a command and it'll ask you a question. And you'll be like, wait, I can't move forward. It won't let me click. What's going on? It's because the, it's waiting for some response in the command line. So we want to be looking and kind of glancing at that. The major difference between this command line and AutoCAD's command line is typically AutoCAD's is at the bottom of the page, Rhino's is at the top of the page. Okay? I leave it at the top of the page because that's the default position that Rhino puts it in. If you really want it at the bottom, you can drag it to the bottom and rearrange your workspace. Okay? Below that, we have our standard set of tools. And these are available as little um, kind of panels that we can pick from. Most of the time, all we need showing is standard. Right? In rare occasions, we might switch to some of the other uh, toolbars that are set. Notice that when I click on a different tab here, it not only changes the ribbon that goes across the top here, it also changes the tool set that goes on the left-hand side. So for example, if I switch to Surface Tools, for example, I get tools up here, and I get a different set of tools right here. Okay, so they change. For the most part, we're going to stick in standard. Okay? So now when we look at the page itself, right, we see what are called four different viewports. And you can kind of see what these viewports are telling us because there's a little on the upper left of each uh, viewport. We can see this is the top view, this is the front view, this is the right side view, and this is perspective view. So Rhino is fundamentally a 3D modeling program. Therefore, 
our objects are going to be three-dimensional. So seeing it in the top front and right side view can be beneficial. Okay? For what we're doing today, we're only going to work in the perspective view. We'll come back and work in the other views a little bit more later on. So what I'm going to want you to do is double click up here where it says perspective. And that will make the perspective view take up all four views. So we're only seeing perspective. If I wanted to go back, I double click on perspective and I get all four views again. Okay, it's easy to go back and forth. So we'll double click on perspective. So now the whole perspective view is showing. There are also tabs down here at the bottom that would let us switch between, say, the front, or excuse me, front, right, perspective views. Okay, but again, we're only going to be in the perspective view for right now. On the right hand side over here, the first little tab that's available is something called properties. And this tells us information about whatever is currently selected or about our file when nothing's selected. So if we look here, we can see that our camera is currently a 50 millimeter. There's, there's a bunch of information there. It's not going to mean much to you yet, but it is there and I like to point it out. The next tab over is the Layers tab. And again, there's not much that we're going to deal with in Layers just yet. We'll talk about that more next class. But it is there and I like to point out that the Layers tab exists. As we move forward, we can have display options. I don't think I've ever done anything in this tab in working on Rhino for 12 years. But it's there, should you want to. Okay. Next over is the Rhino Help menu. So if you get stuck, you can click on the Help, type in something, uh, and you can try to find whatever it is. Okay. So I'm going to leave it on Properties for right now. And for everything we're doing today, you can essentially ignore this over here on the right. Okay. At the very bottom, running across the very bottom, we see a few things. The first thing is it tells us C-plane. It gives us an X, a Y, and a Z position of wherever the mouse is. And you can see that those numbers, I know they're behind my head, right? Those numbers way down here change depending on where I am in the, in the particular plane. Okay. Next over is something called millimeters. Okay. This needs to change because the default units right now are in millimeters. We're not going to be modeling in millimeters today. So I'm going to right click where it says millimeters. And I'm going to go to unit settings, which pops up. When I go to unit settings, I'm going to change right here model units to be in inches. And I'm going to caution you right now to stay away from feet, because you can still type in foot values while you're in inches. But your default, if you don't type anything in, will be in inches. The other big problem is if your units are in feet, it will mess up a lot of the materials that we're going to use because we reference the, the scale of materials by inches. So we want to be in inches as our default. So there we go. It's set in inches. When I click OK, it'll ask me, do I want to scale the drawing? You can say yes or no. It makes absolutely no difference for right now. Okay. And we'll go ahead and say OK. Now you see where it used to say millimeters, it says inches. That's what we're looking for. Okay. The next little box over says default with a black box next to it. That's what layer we're currently drawing on. And again, we're not going to be concerned with layers today, but you can at least be aware that that'll tell you what layer something is on. Okay. Then we move across and we have things like grid snap, ortho, planar, O snap, smart track, gumball, uh, and history. Okay. Do you guys see that or not? Okay, it should be there by default. Sometimes it doesn't show up, which is a problem. Okay, we're going to turn on Object Snap or O Snap. So you want to click on O Snap, and it will pop up a little set of boxes, including end and mid. And I'm going to check end and mid. Okay, so you're going to click on O Snap right down here in the center. When you do O Snap, It'll pop up a little set of boxes, and we're going to check the box for end and check the box for mid. Make sense so far? OK. With those two checked, we can actually start to draw. And we're going to do our first little bit of drawing. So I have referenced, under the second step of part two, uh, Rhinoceros Tutorial 5.2. This is what you're going to be following. It's available online on the course website. And if you go to Tutorials, you go to Rhino, and you click on 5.2 Simple Shapes. This is a step-by-step -step of what we're going to be going through, including little images for what the various tools are and what you're going to be typing in, et cetera. So I'm trying to make this as scripted as possible so you can follow it. 
The other thing that I'll, I'll tell you right now, chances are when we do this today, you're probably going to make a couple of them and practice because practice is always a good thing. The more practice you have, the better off you're going to be. So let's go ahead and let's start making this shape. And I will do this several times because I will lose you along the way a few times. Okay, That's to be expected. So let me go ahead and i got to pull up over here on my notes to make sure I follow the same order. Okay, And we are going to start on step three. Okay, And we're in the perspective view, which is what it's asking us for. We're going to draw a five foot by five foot rectangle right, using the corner to corner tool. So I have a variety of ways of accessing that corner to corner tool. And this is something that you're going to learn a lot in Rhino is that depending on how you work and what your workflow is, you may choose tools in different ways. Okay, So I could go up to the curve menu. I could go to rectangle, corner to corner. That's the corner to corner rectangle tool. I could also come down here and look for the little rectangle and choose rectangle corner to corner. Okay. Notice that it is different from the plane tool or rectangular plane tool. It's just a rectangle. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the rectangle corner to corner. Okay, and I want to draw a rectangle that's five feet by five feet. Okay, and so I can start anywhere that I want. Okay, I'll click. And remember, I told you you want to check what's going on in the little command line up here at the top. Okay, it says after I've clicked once, it says what is the other corner of the rectangle or the length of the rectangle. Okay, so I'm going to type in here what I want my value to be. And intuitively, you would say, oh, I just type in five feet. Instead, I'm going to type in something very specific, and that is, and I'll write it here, I'm going to type at, and I'll explain this next class, but for right now you can just believe me. I'm going to type at 5 feet, comma 5 feet. Okay, And I'll explain what that means, but this is what you're going to type in. And I should have written that in the, the little handout. So I'll type the at sign, 5 apostrophe, Oops, not 65. 5 apostrophe, comma, 5 apostrophe. And I'll hit Enter to finish. And it will draw a little tiny rectangle. Okay? Some of you, it might look a little bigger. It doesn't matter. right? Using the scroll wheel, I can zoom in on a particular object, or I can zoom out on a particular object. Okay? So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on that object so we see it. And now I have this little rectangle for me. Okay? The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make this an actual surface. So I have the rectangle, and right now it's just transparent. It's like a line. And I want to make a surface there. So I'm going to go to the Surface menu and select Patch, which is right here. Or I could actually just type Patch. Right? That's another option. So right here under the Patch Surface options, I tell you in the handout to do 2 by 2. Okay, We don't need more than 2 by 2. I'll go ahead and say OK. And you'll see that I now have a gray square with a little crosshair in the center. Okay. If you're not seeing this shading yet, it's possible that your view is not set to be shaded. It's in wireframe mode. If that's the case, click this little triangle right here up by where it says perspective and switch from wireframe to shaded. And once you see it in shaded mode, you should see a little gray shape like this. Make sense so far? Okay. So once again, what I did was I selected the rectangle. I went up to Surface, Patch, set my U spans to 2 and my V spans to 2. And then I said OK. And that gives me this surface at the bottom. OK, so now that I have the surface at the bottom, and remember I told you I'm going to do this many more times. So if you get lost, just kind of keep watching me do it, and then I'll do the whole thing over again. Okay, So I have that set up. Next thing that I'm going to do is pick that rectangular plane tool again, corner to corner. Or excuse me, did I say rectangular plane or rectangle? Ah, I want the rectangular plane corner to corner. You could do it with the rectangle and patch it. But I'm going to go to this tool right here, which you see has four little dots and a bluish colored surface on it. I'm going to click and hold on it. And I'm going to click rectangular surface. It's this one here. Rectangular plane corner to corner. 
All right. There it is. I could also go up to surface, plane, corner to corner. All right. Again, multiple ways of, of accessing a particular command. OK, so now it says, what's the first corner of my plane? Or guess what? I have some options. Three point, vertical, center, or deformable. I want a vertical. So I can choose to, to click on where it says vertical, or I can type a, a V for vertical and then enter. Doesn't matter whether you click on it or type V. Okay. Then, then it says start of edge. So my edge is going to be from right here. And you should see that it snaps to that edge. And it says end because we turned on end in our snaps. So it should snap right there to the end, boom. And I'm going to go right along this back edge and click again. Then you can see that I'm kind of drawing this up to represent the back side of this shape. And I know that I want this to be a cube, so it's going to be five feet again. So I'll type five with an apostrophe, and I'll hit Enter. Oops. Oh, and it's asking me. Um, whether I want the rectangle going five feet down or five feet up. So I have to make one extra little click here that says I want it going on the up side. And there it is. So let's do that one again. So again, I'll click on the surface, come down here to the rectangle, pick the rectangular plane corner to corner. Or I'll go up to surface, plane, corner to corner. Look at my options here. I want it to be vertical. I'll click on vertical. And I'm going to draw from right there to right there and then up. This time I can snap. I don't actually have to type five feet. And so we'll snap. And so now I have the two back sides of this shape. Okay. Now, if I'm struggling to see what this looks like, I can choose to orbit around this object. Right? Those of you that have used SketchUp before, you know you can pick the orbit command and, and rotate your object around. In the world of Rhino, all you have to do is right click, but you're going to right click and hold, and you can orbit around your object. Okay, So I can make sure that I have a nice view here. There it is, and it'll orbit for me. Okay, The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to use the polyline tool, which is this line right here. It's right below the arrow. And I'm going to draw a line from this corner across over to that corner, right like that. So I go diagonally. Now, polylines, by their nature, continue. So I could keep drawing a line right afterward. I don't want that to be the case. So when I get to this last point here, I'm going to hit Enter. So I draw, let me do that one more time, polyline from this corner to that corner, Enter. And I've finished my line. Make sense so far? All right. So now that I have that line, I'm going to click this first option here, which is a surface from three or four corner points. We'll go ahead and click on that. And I'm going to draw right here, click, right there, click. And you see I'm kind of creating this triangle. And I'll do one more right there. Now, it's going to ask me for another point if I wanted it. I don't want another point. I just want those three. So I'll end by pressing the Enter key on the keyboard. And you see that it's created a little top to my cube. Make sense? OK, so I, now I have a little top surface as well. OK, so now that I have that, right? I'm going to move on. And I want a curve that's down here along this edge. And I can choose to do this by drawing a curve from here to here, or and this is one of the things where the first day you're going to say, why did I make it more complicated? Why am I doing it this way? And the reason that I'm showing you this command this early is because I want you to understand that Rhino has the ability to create what's called derivative geometry. And what that means is when you have a shape or a surface, you can create other shapes and surfaces from that. So I want a line that goes right along that edge of the surface. Instead of drawing a line on top of it, I'm going to duplicate the edge of the surface. So I'll go up to Curve, Curve from Objects, Duplicate Edge. 
And when I do that, it's going to say, what edge do you want to duplicate? There it is. It highlights in yellow. I'll hit Enter. And when I do that, I now have a line that's along that edge. Now, for a straight line at the edge of a cube, it doesn't really matter. You could draw it really fast. But imagine you had a really fancy surface that undulates, a piece of topography or something, and you want the edge. It would be really hard to trace that. So instead, if you derive it from the edge, you get a perfect line right along the edge. Right? So it's important to learn that as a skill. And we're going to review all of this a lot more. Right? First day is always a little bit over the top. You get overwhelmed. Don't worry about it. I'll teach you all of it. I promise. All you have to do is ask somebody in 136 from last semester, did you get it at the end? And they'll say yes. Okay? I promise we'll get there. So I'm going to select this curve right here. And one of the things that happens in Rhino, whenever you have, and this is actually a very, very good feature in Rhino, when you have multiple objects on top of each other, when you go to click to select something, it will bring up this little selection menu and will allow you to scroll through what objects do you want to select. Right? It'll kind of highlight them in pink. It's hard to see the pink on the screen. It'll be easier for you guys to see it um, in, in person. I want this first option here because it's the line that goes right along this edge. I'm going to hold down Shift on the keyboard to select multiple objects. And I'll click this curve right there. And again, I get the selection. I'll select the curve. So now I have this edge, and I have that edge. Okay. Then I'll go up to Surface and then Loft. Or I could just type Loft. As we go along in the semester, I'll do more and more typing commands. For right now, I'm trying to do it without using any type commands. I'll go Surface and then Loft. All of the options are fine. We can just go ahead and say OK. And look at the kind of surface that it created. Okay, So it built, sorry, my mouse up here is touchy, so occasionally I right click accidentally. Right? So it built a curving, twisting surface that connected this edge here to that edge there. Okay? So the last thing that I have to do is I have to finish off this shape with one more surface. And I can do this using a surface from three or four corner points, this first option here. And I'll click on each of the corners. So one, two, and three. I'll hit Enter to finish. And now I have a closed in shape. And I can right click and orbit around my shape to see that it's done. I can zoom in on a little bit. And now I have that shape done. So traditionally, at this point, for those people that are advanced, I would let you do your first V-Ray rendering. Right? The problem is, like I said, V-Ray is not working. So there's a little bit about creating a V-Ray rendering and posting it, but you can't really do that. So I'm going to show you an alternate. And all that we're going to do is capture what I currently see on the screen. And this is what we'll ultimately post to the course website. And so to do that, I'll click on this little triangle next to where it says Perspective. I'll go down to the option for Capture to File. This will then save a JPEG. You see JPEG there. I'll put it on the desktop. And this would be Exercise. Uh, 201, and I'll click Save. So now I have a JPEG of what it is that I created. Okay, that's what you're going to ultimately post to the website. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and delete this and start and do the whole thing again. Okay, if you feel like you got there, try to do it by yourself. See if you could do it. If you can't do it, it's no big deal. It's just going to take some more practice. Okay, question. OK, so I'll tell you what. We'll take a quick break right now. I'll come around. For those of you that haven't gotten your logins or whatever yet, let's, let's solve that problem. And then I'll come back and I'll demo this one more time. Is it possible to look at the bottom of that? 